to the Tomarosa. As you may remember, we uh, started making cheese this year, and we are a seasonal dairy, so we milk from May until February, and it's almost the end of January. So that means that we're getting close to the end of our season, and in fact, today is a special day. It is our last batch of cheese. We have a couple more processings where we're going to do fluid milk, but uh, for cheese, this is going to be a wrap. So today we are making a uh, traditional cheddar that we're going to press the majority of it, but we're also going to have some that we sell as a cheese curds in a container. We need quite a bit of hot water. We need we're quite on, a bit of hot water. We're only at 88. All right. We've been using our pasteurizer also as a cheese fat. It's Works been, good. It's been working well. Um, we've learned how to kind of figure out how much water to let out of the jacket to put in hot water so we can raise the temperature. And our current recipe, we're trying to get the curd up to 102, 102 degrees. Over 30 minutes. Over 30 minutes. As you know, Stacy and I uh, love cheese. Love cheese. It's delicious. And we started our dairy with um, some good dairy knowledge and good mentors. Uh, however, we had never previously made cheese. So uh, we got some books and we watched some YouTube videos and we got some really good mentors. And um, do you want to share a story about our mentors? Our main cheese making mentors are Brent and Yvonne at Yuma Pine Creamery. They're in Northeast Oregon and we've known them for a really, really, really long time. And I've known them for a really, 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 really long time. Um, actually, uh, my dad hauled their milk uh, way back when in the 90s and I used to visit their farm. Uh, they weren't making cheese at the time, but they were dairy farming. And I actually, my last summer before I joined the Coast Guard, I went down there for a little while and stayed with them and learned about cows and milking and probably where I kind of got the bug. And then eventually they started making cheese on their farm and, and we visited them several times. And they have really been great mentors in helping us get started. They've loaned us some supplies when we were first getting started. So, um, and they make really good cheese too. So that's our mentors. And again, it's really important to have a good mentor. So you, did you always have questions? We always have questions uh, that we're always calling and asking them. We almost have the curds up to temperature now. So we're going to be stirring for a while as we cook them. And so we talked to you some more. Do you want to show them what it looks like? I don't and know you if you could really tell from the last time, but uh, the curds are definitely a lot smaller and they've expelled more whey. Okay, so we're going to talk about how did our cheese season go. So what were some great things, some, some not so great things, and then our favorite things. All right. Um, overall, I think it went pretty well, especially for a couple of beginners. You know, we don't have a long lineage of uh, cheesemakers throughout history behind us. Uh, we're it, first generation cheesemakers. But overall, we mostly turned out stuff that tasted good, which is, I guess, the goal. We had one fail with a feta once. And yeah, so in December, I was going to make some feta to sell at the Christmas market. And I made it just like I normally do, and I put it in the brine, and then like two to three weeks later, I went to take it out of the brine. And it was just this completely, like it had soaked up the brine, and it had become this like, just this like square mass of not goodness. Gooiness, like you try to lift it up, your fingers would just go through it. It was so gross. And it didn't smell like feta, so I'm pretty sure what happened there is the culture I used was like the tail end of culture and the bottom of a packet that I had used multiple times. Uh, it may have also been near the end of its shelf life. 
And I just don't think the culture was right. So I, I think everything else, we, like at the beginning of the process, everything went fine, the curd looked right. It was just more of the culture as it went forward. So I learned there that you should use good cultures and uh, make sure that they're within their, uh, their date. What was your favorite cheese that you made? My favorite cheese. Ooh. I really like Gouda. Uh, I like Gouda and I like how much other people like Gouda. Uh, so uh, we made our Gouda first in October so that we have some to sell at the Christmas market. And um, that went really well. And then we just made three batches of Gouda and now we're making this batch of cheddar. So do you want to show them the inside of the cheese cave? Sure. All right, let's see what we got in here. So on the top shelf here, we have uh, some our last Gouda, which is still drying, which will be waxed probably tomorrow. And then some Gouda here. Now you see those dark spots in there? That's, that's not bad. That's a pepper jack. Some more Goudas. On this shelf here, these two little cheddars. We call that a solstice cheddar. Cause we made it on the, the winter solstice and we plan to not open them until the summer solstice. That's what is in our cheese cave. And uh, Stacy, what is your favorite cheese that we made? Well, I do like the Gouda. I mean, it, it's such a versatile cheese, but I really like the pepper jack. Oh, I forgot about pepper jack. That oh wait, I want to change my answer. I, I like the Gouda, I like the Gouda. I love that everybody loves the Gouda, but I expected the Gouda to be good. The Monterey jack and the pepper jack really surprised me. Okay, you can do good. So for, for our pepper jack, we did not use jalapenos. Uh, we kind of broke with tradition. And we actually used uh, crushed black peppercorns and red pepper flakes. And I thought it was pretty amazing. Pretty, pretty amazing, so. Uh, and the thing that I really liked about it too was, um, it's especially the Monterey Jack because it, is one of the only cheeses that was developed and made in the United States. It is a true... And, and the only Western American. Right, so our label, um, we call it the cheese of the American West. And it's, a, it's just a really good solid cheese. You can use it in so many different applications and it melts amazingly. I just love it. And it, I mean, it's a fairly fresh cheese, so you don't have to age it long before you can start putting it out there. Right, that's the other thing that's really good about it. Oh, I really like cheese curds too. Oh yeah! And, and, and it's interesting because when we, we told our customers we had cheese curds for sale, there's one of either two responses. Super excitement because they know what cheese curds are and they love them and everybody loves cheese curds who, who knows what they are. And then the other was, what are those? I think what was the one line is uh, I don't want I don't want deconstructed cheese. Yeah. <laughs> but you know I, I like cheese curds too. So and uh, when we make cheese, anytime there's usually a little bit of curd left over that didn't make it in the mold, so we always keep that. It's great for putting in eggs and stuff. Let's go over what cheeses we made this year. Okay. So we made feta, which was a fresh cheese. And that was our first cheese that, that we was ever our made. First cheese. And it turned out well. It was a, one of the later fetas that we had in trouble with. Right. We actually did feta a couple times really well. And then we did kafili, which Kef is a Welsh cheddar. Which is a little bit more moist than a traditional cheddar. Yeah, it's supposed to be more of like a fresh cheddar. Um, and then we did gouda. Gouda, yeah. I think that was the third cheese we tried. And cheese curds, cheddar cheese curds. And that was just a whole batch of curds, right? We didn't press any of those. Yeah. And then, then we did the Monterey Jack and Pepper Jack. And that was a split batch. So we made a whole batch of Monterey, and then we split the curds in half. Half got pressed as is, and then the other half had the, the peppers, uh, peppercorns and uh, red pepper flakes mixed in. And we are, our focus right now is learning how to use our setup and our equipment to make just good solid cheese. There's a lot of um, really talented artisanal cheesemakers all around. I bet wherever you're at, there's a local cheesemaker. 
And uh, we're just going to continue to build our skills. You know, we'd probably like to add some seasonings to maybe some of the Gouda and the cheddar. I think someday I'd like to smoke Gouda too. Oh yeah, that too. Eventually. But this year, moving forward, starting in May, all the cheese that uh, Stacy showed you in the cheese cave, we're aging so we have something to sell in May before the cows are up and producing milk full time. And this year our goal is to um, have fresh cheeses pretty much every farmer's market. And that could be feta, it could be the Monterey Jack, Pepper Jack, and cheese curds. And we didn't really start making hard cheeses until the fall, kind of, right? So it'll be interesting to see the variation we get from the spring milk versus fall and winter milk. Would you like to share uh, how much butterfat Carnation is putting into her milk right now? She is employee of the month. It's pretty spectacular though. You know, usually our butterfat ranges definitely above 4%, maybe around 5%. So Carnation, uh, on our last uh, DHIA test, which is Dairy Herd Improvement Association, it's a testing organization, uh, her butter fat was 7.45%. Protein was 4.94. Um, the solids non-fat, which uh, is really important for cheese making because that's what cheese is, is in, a, in addition to the butter fat, it's, it's the other milk solids. Her solids non-fat were 10.35, which is really good. And she had a, a low somatic cell count, so we're very happy. She is employee of the month, Carnation. You know, for comparison, most of you already know, but whole milk in the United States is standardized to 3.25%. So that's, that's double. <laughs> For aging the cheese, we kind of have a temporary solution in place right now. We showed you earlier we have that large, it's an upright freezer is what it is, but we have a secondary thermostat on it which uh, doesn't allow it to get below about 55 degrees. So that's where we keep it, about 55, 56 degrees. And for us, it was a good temporary solution uh, because it was affordable, it was quick, and even when we don't need that upright freezer as a cheese cave, we'll still have an upright freezer and we could always use those on the farm. So our temporary cheese cave worked well for us, uh, but as you can see, it's pretty full and that's only after about five days of cheese making. So we need to have an actual cheese cave built into our barn somewhere. We have identified part of our uh, feed tack room that we can enclose. So that is the plan uh, over this winter, is hopefully build one of those uh, cheese caves. And then the other part of aging is what do you do with the cheese once you make it? So fresh cheese, you can package up and sell right away. And then uh, by aged cheese, cheese that you press that you want to age, you either need to let it get like a natural rind that you somehow control, or you need to either wax it or put it into some type of plastic. And we decided we wanted to wax it and we decided we wanted to use beeswax. So as you saw in a previous video, we had a lot of uh, learning to do with using beeswax. Eventually what we found out is that using the crock pot just to warm it and then dipping uh, the pieces in and then using a brush to cover the rest worked the best. And that's the method that we use now. But we really like using beeswax because it's from a local uh, beekeeper. It smells amazing. Our customers are super excited about the fact that we're not using a, a petroleum or plastic based uh, wax, which a lot of cheese wax is. And it, it just is beautiful. So we like that it's part of like a local uh, production that we're doing. I think too that the uh, beeswax does actually uh, affect the flavor in a good way of the cheese itself because you do get that kind of floral uh, essence to the cheese and I well, think just, yeah just on the edge yeah so I, I think it definitely makes our cheese a little bit more special and uh, unique and unique so um, and people seem to like it so we like it and we like supporting our other local uh, farmers in the area because bees are livestock too we are draining the whey. We have our curds trenched in the vat. 
give them a few more minutes to kind of knit together, and then we do what's called the chittering process, which means we'll cut, cut it into slabs, we'll flip them over and just start stacking them on top of each other. So these stacks have been stacked and flipped a, a few times now. All right, we cut up the curds, now we're gonna add salt. So we talked a lot about cheese today, and one thing we need to cover is uh, selling cheese. So we have a, a lot of customers who love everything we make. So when we talk about we were making them cheese, we were making cheese, they were super excited, and we always sold out of all the cheese we made. We uh, do our cheese about $20 to $30 a pound, depending on what type of cheese it is. Cheese making is something that's uh, quick and easy. In fact, it's only a half a day operation. It usually takes us from about seven to seven. <laughs> no, it is, a, it is an art and it is a science and you have to be patient and you can't rush things. And that's just the way it is. And we look forward to learning more and uh, we love having cheese as another uh, product that we can sell because it's another way to uh, make the harvest go further. So the cheese that we have now we're going to sell in May and that's super exciting. And as a seasonal dairy it does also help us bridge the gap. So thanks for coming along with us as we talked a little bit about how cheese went this year and we showed you a little bit about making some uh, cheddar cheese. So stay cheesy out there. And have a good one. Bye.